So my name is Jacob, and my last name is Chernenko. I was born on June 29, 2007, the same day Apple released the first iPhone. But honestly, I couldn't care less about that. Smartphones are just a necessary evil for me. I use them because I have to, not because I want to. People often mistake me for being younger than I actually am. I'm 17, but I look like I'm still in middle school. It's not because of any medical condition or disease. I'm just naturally skinny. My family always jokes that I'm allergic to gaining weight. Speaking of diseases, I do have one F41.2, a fancy name for mixed anxiety and depressive disorder. But I don't like to dwell on it. It's just a part of who I am, and I'm trying to learn to live with it. I've spent my entire life in St. Petersburg, born and raised in a neighborhood that's often compared to San Francisco's Tenderloin District, a place where the city's dark underbelly is hidden from view. Tourists flock here, mesmerized by the grandeur of the Hermitage and the Church of the Savior on Blood, but they rarely venture into the gritty, run-down areas where locals like me live. I've grown up surrounded by the city's ugly truth crumbling buildings, trash-filled streets, and a palpable sense of desperation. I like to think of myself as the herald of garbage, the one who sees beyond the facade and calls out the city's flaws. My home is in a drab, low-budget housing complex, affectionately known as the Chinese Wall due to its imposing, fortress-like design. The apartments here are tiny, overpriced, and often inherited as if they're some kind of burdensome family heirloom. It's a far cry from the picturesque St. Petersburg you see in travel brochures. I've got two furry companions, two cats that I rescued from the harsh streets of St. Petersburg. I took them in because I believe that at least they deserve a chance to live a life free from struggle. They shouldn't have to scrounge around for food or find shelter in some abandoned alleyway. They did nothing to deserve the cruelty and neglect that humans inflict on them. It's not their fault that they were born into a world that often seems determined to crush them. My cats are innocent, and they should be able to eat well, sleep safely, and live without fear. I've seen firsthand the horrors that humans can unleash on animals, the abandonment, the abuse, the neglect. It's a never-ending cycle of cruelty, and it's one that I'm trying to break, at least in my own small way, by giving my cats a loving home. I've always had a soft spot for animals, all animals. Dogs, cats, rats, mice, lizards, you name it. I think it's hypocritical to claim you only love one specific type of animal, like cats. That's just not how it works. You either have compassion and empathy for all living creatures, or you don't. Of course, there are some animals that I may not fully understand or know how to care for, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate their place in the world. For me, it's not about preferring one species over another. It's about recognizing the inherent value of every living being. Unfortunately, my financial situation means I can only provide a home for cats right now. They're relatively low maintenance and affordable. But that doesn't mean I don't dream of one day being able to help other animals in need. The holidays are here, and for now, I get to enjoy a brief respite from the drudgery of daily life, but I know it won't last. Soon, I'll be dragged back to school. A place where I feel like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. I've never been a fan of the rigid structure and social pressures that come with it. Give me a quiet corner and a Wi-Fi connection, and I'm set. I can spend hours surfing the internet, lost in a world of information and ideas. Where I don't have to deal with the awkwardness of human interactions. Speaking of which, I've always struggled to connect with people. I find it hard to express myself, to understand social cues, and to navigate the complex web of relationships. But I've been told, it's not because I'm on the autism spectrum, it's just me. Being my awkward, introverted self, Sometimes I wish I could blame it on a label, but it's just my quirks and flaws that make socializing such a challenge. Remember those over-the-top villains from old Hollywood action movies? The ones who always seem to have a personal vendetta against the world? Well, don't believe them when they try to charm you with stereotypes about Russians being cute and endearing. Trust me, that's just a facade. I've seen the darker side of human nature, and I can tell you that society can be cruel and unforgiving. I've worked in the service sector, and I've experienced firsthand how people will take advantage of you if you're younger, smaller, or weaker. They'll push you around, belittle you, and make you feel like dirt. Not because there's any real justification for it, but simply because they can. Because you won't fight back, or because you won't meet their aggression with equal force. It's a harsh reality, but one that I've learned to navigate. And it's taught me to be wary of people's true intentions, especially when they're trying to charm their way past my defenses. I recently devoured Robert McCammon's Night Calls the Green Falcon, and I was struck by the eerie similarities between the world he created and my own. It's as if he peered into my soul and put my deepest thoughts and feelings into words. The way he weaves together themes of darkness, redemption, and the struggle for justice resonated deeply with me. 
It's an amazing book, one that I couldn't put down even when the words blurred together on the page. I've had a similar experience with The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks and To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Despite being written by different authors, these books share a common thread a raw, unflinching look at the human condition. I know some people might think it's strange to find connections between seemingly disparate works, but I've always been meticulous about the books I read. I dissect them, analyze them, and absorb them into my being. And when I find common ground between them, it's like stumbling upon a hidden treasure trove of understanding. But I suppose I should at least make an attempt to write that essay about what I read over the summer. The problem is, I didn't exactly follow the assigned reading list. To be honest, I didn't even come close. But that's not the point, from my perspective. The only things that truly matter are cats and hair. And speaking of hair, I've been conducting an experiment. My hair has grown down to my shoulders now, and I'm curious to see just how long it can get if I leave it completely alone. No washing, no touching, no nothing. I know it sounds strange, but I'm fascinated by the idea of letting my hair grow wild and untamed like a living entity unto itself. It's like a science experiment, but instead of test tubes and beakers, I'm using my own head. I wonder how long it'll take for people to start noticing or if they'll even care. Maybe I'll become known as the kid with the crazy hair, or maybe I'll just be seen as a weirdo. Either way, it's an experiment worth conducting. So here's the truth. Instead of following the assigned summer reading list, I decided to take a different approach. I dove headfirst into the Old and New Testaments, fascinated by the stories and teachings within. But, being the seeker of diverse perspectives that I am, I didn't stop there. I also devoured the Quran and the Srimad Bhagavatam, eager to explore the wisdom of other faiths. And of course, I couldn't help but think of the inimitable Hank Moody, the fictional author and troublemaker from Californication. His irreverent wit and insightful observations on life, love, and everything in between resonated deeply with me. But I knew I couldn't quote him in my school essay not because his words aren't profound, but because my teachers wouldn't appreciate the reference. They don't know who Hank Moody is, and even if they found out, I'd just shrug it off. But the truth is, Hank's words speak to me on a deeper level, and those who understand will know exactly what I mean. It's like having a secret language, one that transcends the mundane and speaks to the essence of the human experience. I don't have much to call my own no Google account, no social media profiles, no digital footprint, but that's okay because I have something far more valuable books. And films, they're like time machines, transporting me to different eras, perspectives, and worlds. When I read, I become completely absorbed, tuning out my surroundings and losing myself in the words. It's as if I've developed a sixth sense, one that allows me to tap into the thoughts and emotions of the authors and characters. Interestingly, I learned to write before I spoke, not because I was born with a pen in my hand, but because talking wasn't exactly encouraged in my family. It's as if we're all silently waiting for Dr. Xavier's telepathic miracle to kick in, allowing us to communicate without words. My psychiatrist thinks I'm crazy, twirling his finger around his temple whenever I mention it. But I just nod in agreement, maybe he's right, maybe I am a little crazy. But, in a world where words are scarce, books and films are my sanity. But then there are moments that are completely beyond my control, no matter how hard I try. All I can do is accept them and move on. Like the summer reading list, for instance. Just looking at it makes my stomach turn the thought of slogging through those boring, outdated books is almost too much to bear. Forget it, I'd rather do just about anything else. You know what? I think I'll just go for a walk instead. Fresh air, clear my head, try to shake off the feeling of dread that's settling in. Maybe I'll stumble upon something interesting. Something that'll make me forget all about that miserable reading list. Or maybe I'll just enjoy the silence, the solitude, and the freedom to think my own thoughts. Either way, it's got to be better than forcing myself to read something that's only going to put me to sleep.